Hey, it's Heidi Rain. Welcome back. And if you're new here, welcome home. It is so good to see you today. I have such a great topic to talk about today. I'm so excited because it's my favorite thing to talk about here at Dysfunction Junction. And what is that? All things codependency, addiction, and toxic relationships. And so if you're in a relationship of any kind that causes you anxiety, confusion, resentment, pain, numbness, overwhelm, hopelessness, oh my God, the list goes on and on, you definitely came to the right place. So I am so glad you're here. Now, originally, when codependency was first discussed way back in the day by the pioneers of this work, like Melody Beattie and Pia Melody, it was always kind of referenced in relationship to addiction, meaning the co-addicted, co-dependent, meaning there was the addict or alcoholic and the person who was addicted to the alcoholic. And so, but, but now I think there are maybe, there's maybe even easier way to explain this and really break it down so that you can see yourself more clearly, because honestly, there's nothing more confusing than trying to explain codependency. In fact, it's one of the most misunderstood things because again, it's not a diagnosable thing in the DSM. It's not like you're going to go in and you have that and get stamped and labeled with it, but it is a pattern that you run, a relationship pattern that you run. In fact, I call them attachment personality patterns, and there are eight different personality patterns that we run that interfere with our ability to have a successful, healthy, mutually beneficial, oh, and balanced relationship. And so these are the root behaviors that really keep us stuck, struggling, sacrificing, or sucking it up. So we're going to go over some of these behaviors today, how they fit in with addiction so that you can see yourself. Now at any time, if you want the uh, version of this at your fingertips, the, the information in your hot little hands, go over to lovecoachheidi.com and download my book, Attachment Personality Patterns, where you can look for your patterning. Now again, don't have to be in a relationship with an addict or an alcoholic to be classified as codependent. Uh, anybody can have these patterns, but they usually originate from some kind of dysfunction because all codependency really is at the end of the day is a way to function in dysfunction. So if you grew up in a dynamic that wasn't found on all cylinders, didn't have to be addicted, could have been abusive, might have just been absent, might have been a sick parent, might have been a troubled sibling. Anything where there was a kind of major or even you know moderate dysfunction in the household is going to create some of these attachment personality pattern issues because when you're born into a family like that, you really don't have the ability or capability to be yourself fully because you kind of survey the land and you look around at the maybe shit show that's going on and you say, hmm, <clears throat> who do I need to be in order to be all right up in here? And so we take on that personality. And as Dr. Joe Dispenza says, your personality is your personal reality. And so what we want to do here at Love Coach Heidi, our aim with my company and my personal development workshops, retreats, and programs is to help you on, uh, first of all, uncover your unique codependency programming and your patterning that you're running and the origin of that patterning so that you can rip it up by the root and actually be your true authentic self. And when you're your true self, all decisions come easily, life gets easier, relationships become easier, and you're not finding yourself scratching your head, playing a game, trying to figure out how to win at this thing called relationships. And so I wanna encourage you, if you're curious, about taking a deep dive with me and joining with me at a retreat or in a workshop or one of my programs, go over to lovecoachheidi.com and schedule a complimentary consultation. So let's dive in to addiction and codependence and exactly how it looks, all right? Now, if you're in a relationship with an addict or an alcoholic, your codependency can manifest in multiple different personalities. And I'm going to go over a few of them with you here and talk about how this might look in your relationship and then the next steps to kind of break free. So the first thing that an alcoholic or an addict, uh, you have to understand about an alcoholic or an addict is what pattern are they running? What pattern are they running? And now most of us, we know this is like a no brainer because we've seen it all the time. And it is usually the pattern of the victim. And the victim kind of looks like I am the way I am because. Now we all have life situations, traumatic events that have made us kind of who we are. The difference between a victim and a victor is that a victim uses that as an excuse to stay dysfunctional and toxic. And a person who's healthy 
as a person who's healed that and taken responsibility, even though they didn't create the trauma, they assumed the responsibility to heal it and to get better. But a person who's addicted actively uses their trauma as a reason to kind of stay stuck. And they'll say things like, my hands are tied. There's nothing I can do. They'll refuse to use the tools. Maybe you've seen that. You've given them the tools and, and they just don't apply them. They don't put the effort in. And when you ask them, you know, why they're continuing to struggle, they'll say things like, well, I, it's, my, it's not my fault. It's so-and-so's fault. Or because that treatment didn't work or this program doesn't work for me or that thing. And so really that's a victim mentality. It is all blame. It's all projection. It's all taking all my flaws and all my issues and projecting them onto other people and making it your fault that I, the reason that I'm stuck. Now, who is going to sign up for that? Who is going to take this complicated, complex person who is wrestling with addiction uh, or alcoholism and say, I think I can deal in that. Well, it's a codependent person. And one of the personalities is the personality of the fixer. Now, fixer will look at a victim and go, dun, da, 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 put on the cape and start to run to the rescue. A fixer sees a project instead of a person. Fixers are wonderful people. One of their superpowers is that they have the ability to look at somebody and see the absolute best in that person. They can look at any situation and see the positivity. However, sometimes it can really bite you in the ass because it can become toxic positivity where you have this belief system that everybody can be their best possible version of themselves, so long as the best possible version of themselves matches up with what you believe the best possible version of them is. And sometimes your best version just isn't the reality of the capability of the person that you're looking at. So it's kind of like you're holding them hostage to some some standard or expectation that they're just never going to live into. But fixers love a good project. And maybe you didn't realize that when you got into it, and you feel like you're kind of blindsided, like, oh, this person wasn't addicted. I didn't attract them on purpose. But I bet you if you look back, you probably do see some red flags and some signs there. And maybe if you look back in your history, you can see this this isn't your first rodeo dealing with people that you needed to care for and take care of. And in fact, in my programs and retreats and workshops, I have a lot of people in the care industry. I actually serve a lot of doctors in my practice, a lot of people who are in the healthcare world that are are just naturally great and inspired to take care of people. But as a doctor, I tell my doctors all the time, like save that energy for going in and healing the planet and create relationships where you can be fueled up, not depleted continually where you're, you're trying to fix things at work and fix people and help people. And then you're going home and you're dealing with the same dynamic, right? Uh, or we, I track lots of coaches. I actually have a lot of coaches. I'm a coach to coaches. And these are people who are used to helping people for a living. And then they go home and their relationships are a mess and they just don't know how to set the boundaries around when to put the fixer hat on and help people and when to take it off and relax and receive. And so that's the work that we get to do is to help people make that distinction and really decide what kind of relationship they want. Do they want a one-sided relationship where they're always pouring in and it's not reciprocal? It's very unbalanced and fixers are resentful as hell because they'll go so long in the relationship being like, okay, I'm going to pour my resources into you. I'm going to believe in you. But when the victim does not take accountability or responsibility, which they don't, then the fixer gets really pissed off and they think, well, what am I doing here? And they get so resentful. I'm always there for you and nobody's there for me. And so that codependent relationship is a match made in hell and it continues on and on and on. And the only way out is to is to really excavate your authentic self and stop playing this personality pattern that you took on so long ago. And that's the way out. All right. The next person, the next type of codependent who hooks up with an addict or an alcoholic is a withholder. Now, withholders are people that want love more than anything else in the world. They're highly sensitive people, but they're scared as hell of it. They're afraid of the intimacy. They're afraid of being rejected. And so they want people in, but they kind of keep them at an arm's distance. Now, again, I've invented five criteria for each of these patterns. So if you go over to lovecoachheidi.com, you can download the book and read about the withholder and see the patterning there. But so we're just kind of giving an overview right now, but the withholder is once, like I said, to be close, but they're because they're so afraid of it, they tend to seek out emotionally, psychologically unavailable people. 
And so if I'm a withholder and I get into a relationship with an addict, that's also a perfect match for me in my dysfunction because there's no threat of getting too close because this person can't get too close because they're hijacked by a substance, so they're emotionally available. But if I'm a withholder, I can pretend that I wanna have this intimate relationship and I can keep like trying to make it work and, and using whatever uh, mental gymnastics I can perform to create a fantasy about how this relationship could be if it were healthy and how close we could be, but we never actually quite get there. And the withholder actually subconsciously needs that because again, their biggest fear is that somebody would really see them fully, want them all the way, and be totally available to them. That's scary as hell to withhold her. So if you're if you're in a relationship with an addict or an alcoholic, you could be running a codependency pattern of a fixer or withholder, or maybe even a little bit of both. Another pattern that hooks up with an addict or an alcoholic is a controlling pattern. This usually, this controlling pattern originates from usually growing up in addiction or dysfunction where they were nine going on 40, feeling like they always had to be in control and in charge of everything. And if they didn't stay in control, bad things were going to happen. So this is a person, it's my way or the highway. They want to tell people how to think, feel, and behave. And usually you'd think, well, a controller would never hook up with an addict or an alcoholic because they can't control a damn thing. They have the illusion of control. Many controllers are in relationships with addicts or alcoholics where they try to control having how much somebody uses. They dole out the medication as a controller. They're the ones that are like searching out the recovery program and trying to control somebody's entire recovery process. They're, they're the ones on the phone with the therapist. What did you talk about today? They're the ones calling the doctors and the friends and going through the Facebooks and do you like my phone case? They're the ones going through the, the Facebook and contacting all the people and, and trying to control everything. And so again, controllers really have no control at all anyway. That's the reality, right? We don't have control over anything, but a controller will have the illusion of that when they're in a relationship with an addict or an alcoholic because there's so much to control. So it'll keep a controller very busy for a very long time. And also victims love controllers because they're like, well, I, you know, you didn't do a good job. And if you did this, I wouldn't, they love to blame and they love to put the responsibility on the controller and the controller's like, yeah, it is my responsibility. So it's a, again, a match made in hell. Now the, the other kind of relationship codependent that hooks up with an addict and alcoholic is a clinger personality. And this is a person who grew up learning. It's a ride or die. You are loyal to a fault. You are loyal to people who don't deserve you. This is an adult children of alcoholic trait. In fact, all of these things are adult children of alcoholics trait. And if you want more information on that, there are other videos in here. There's a whole playlist called Adult Children of Alcoholics, and it'll explain more about the, the tendency. Because if you're like, man, I, I can relate to almost all of these, likely you are an ACA or an ACOA. And I think that that it's not really a diagnosis. It's like a pattern, a pattern diagnosis. Like, oh my God, I remember the first time I took a, an ACOA class and I read a book on it and I was like, oh my God, somebody else like me. And I thought, well, I didn't know that when you grow up in a house of addiction, there are these tendencies, these traits, and, and it can be addiction, dysfunction, abuse, codependency traits originate from that. Mm -hmm. And adult children of alcoholics have very specific things that they do. So uh, clinging is one of them. I'm a ride or die. I'm loyal to a fault. When you grow up in a house of alcoholism or dysfunction, you, you learn to be loyal to the people that are hurting you. And so a person who is a clinger personality will hook up with an addict or an alcoholic and it'll just feel like home. Well, I love them no matter what. Nobody loves them the way I love them. I'm going to stick with them. And you're hoping as a clinger, somebody's going to reciprocate that. You're hoping that they're going to see your value and really pick you, but they never quite do. And that's familiar territory for you. How do you break free from that? Well, you make a decision that you're in, you re recognize, oh my God, this is a personality pattern. This is a mask I put on. This isn't my true identity. I want to uncover my authentic true self so that I can live an authentically happy life. And that's the next step for you. Now, 
The last pattern that I think that hooks up with an addict or an alcoholic is a pretending pattern. And this is a person who's like, suck it up, buttercup. The show must go on. They lie just to look good. This is a person who's really concerned about optics. Now you'd think, will that personality be the last one to hook up with an addict or an alcoholic because it make them look bad. But a pretender is used to being in shit and making it shine, okay? They're used to being in situations growing up where they had to pretend and put on a face that everybody's fine and everything's falling apart. So that's the pattern. Pretenders originated from dysfunction, but needing to like, just everything's great. Everything's wonderful. And just the show must go on. And so a lot of times you'll find people in very high positions, people that are extremely successful from the outside looking in, you think they have it all together, but behind closed doors, they are dealing with this serious dysfunction. And again, they're just, it's a trauma bond. All of these relationships are trauma bonded relationships and trauma bonded relationships are codependent relationships. It originated out of some kind of dysfunction and we're just continuing on with that dysfunction, repeating that pattern over and over again until you allow me to come alongside of you and break that pattern for good. So awareness is always the first step, right? That's the important thing about these videos is you go, holy shit, man, she is singing my song. I I can resonate with all these things she's saying. And that is so cool. That is amazing. You know, the end result, like Leo Buscalia said, the end result of all true uh, learning is change. So when you really know something at your core, the end result is you become a different, you change. You manifest into the person that you always know that you were and are deep inside. However, awareness alone doesn't do that. We need to put the awareness in motion, aim. Aim for success by uh, allowing me to come alongside of you and implement this into your life. There are very specific things that you need to do to break the patterns that you have been running. The first thing is understand exactly how your pattern is running. And you can download that free book at lovecoachheidi.com to see that and really make notes for yourself on how, and then you set about the business of breaking free. And that requires efforting. That requires an investment in yourself of time, Uh, you know, whether that's a workshop, a two day thing, a a week long retreat, or it's a three month program where you invest the time in yourself, invest the resources in yourself to start making a change. Now, here's the thing. If you are a fixer personality in particular, you will pour your resources into everybody else and you are last on the list. Is that true? It is right. I've had many, many times when somebody has finally made the decision to invest in themselves where they actually cry with joy because they're like, holy shit, this is the first time I'm actually putting myself first and taking care of myself with a willing demonstration of my love for myself by putting my money where my mouth is and making a financial investment into my own recovery or and the time investment into my own recovery. All right, so really making a choice to effort this to get well, because I, I'll tell you the truth, once you break these patterns, your life is never the same again. So, you know, if you're ready to have mutually beneficial relationships where you feel seen and heard and respected and cherished and valued and wanted and desired and chosen, then you need to lead the way. You need to cherish and cherish and choose you by making the investment in your own recovery. All right. I love you so much. I hope this video was helpful for you. Please like it and leave a comment because YouTube is a big place and it's very hard to help people. One of the most common comments I get on my videos is how the hell does this video not have like a million views? Now I'm not being cocky. I think it's really helpful information, right? And I didn't just like make this information up. This is like decades worth of experience and downloads and divine knowledge and practical hands-on experience. And so I, I think, I think a lot of people can benefit from this too. However, YouTube is so big, you know, it's hard to find. So if you're here, it's divine design. Okay. You, you've been led here. Can you comment so more people can have access? Okay. That's all I'm asking, right? Just comment, like it. All right. I love you. I hope you take excellent care of yourself and I will see you very, very soon in another video or in one of my programs. Take care. Bye.